Hello everyone and welcome to the FameLab International Final 2020. How exciting is this? We are live right now from Cheltenham in the UK, which is where we would have been doing the FameLab International Final had this year not really gone according to plan. And um, what's cool though is we have leveled up for the final and we are in a fancy studio, I tell you. Have a look at this. That's the Infinite Cove. Here's some of the team. Look at that, here we go. And if you come around here, you can see everyone's socially distanced. Everyone's in a mask apart from me. And look at this. These are the trophies that the winners are, uh, are going for tonight. More on them very, very soon. But come into the little studio area. This is gonna be my home for the next hour or so. Uh, we have a live chat. Please get in that live chat and say hello. Jump in on the conversation. Um, let's see who is there and in the conversation right now. All right, we have got hello to the dreamer on the YouTube chat who is tuning in from the UK and taking a long tea break to watch the final. Uh, hello, you're very welcome. Uh, Tarsos, our Greek national winner, is watching. Uh, Hatib is rooting for Malaysia. Uh, we've got Eugen, who loves FameLab and waits for it every year. Uh, also, we've got Gabby, Gabriella, our uh, Brazilian finalist, is in the chat. I should introduce myself too, as well, shouldn't I? Hello, my name is Greg Foote. I am a science presenter on TV and radio. I'm a YouTuber, a, podcast and a, a podcaster, and a science communication trainer. I will be your host this afternoon and evening. If you're watching this, I expect you know what FameLab is, but if not, here is something to explain what it's all about. FameLab is the leading science communication competition and training program in the world. Each year, thousands of researchers from across the globe receive training and then compete in heats. FameLab was created by Cheltenham Science Festival and is delivered globally in partnership with the British Council, making science accessible for all. FameLabbers have three minutes to capture their audience. Three judges judge them on the three C's of FameLab. Content, clarity and charisma. And you, the audience, vote for your favourite too. Each country crowns their national champion and those national champions come together to compete for the title of FameLab International Champion. FameLab participants have gone on to present TV shows, give TED Talks, publish books and so much more. FameLab is all about giving skills, confidence and opportunities to scientists, engineers and mathematicians to communicate their current research with the people that it impacts. And this, of course, is the 2020 FameLab International Final. So this year, 20 countries took part. In each of those, a final was held to crown a national champion. 20 national finalists came together to compete in the FameLab International Semi-Finals. And 10 of those made it through to this, the FameLab International Final. 10 of the world's most charismatic and chatty scientists and engineers who will tonight be battling it out for the prestigious title of FameLab International Champion. Now I say battling it out, it's much more friendly like that. This is how it works, okay? Each finalist will have three minutes to share their science in an engaging and entertaining way. They can use props, but they can't use slides. It's just them talking to us about their science for three minutes. They will be watched by three judges who will listen to their talk, ask them a follow-up question each, and then after the finalists have presented, the judges then go away, they huddle, they debate, they argue, they cry, whatever it takes to choose the person who will be crowned the FameLab International Champion 2020. That champion will walk away with a prize and one of those beautiful trophies I showed you earlier. The judges will also name two runners-up who will also get a trophy. Um, oh, and don't you think you get to just sit back and relax and enjoy the show? Oh, no, 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 no. You lot get to choose who to crown the FameLab International 2020 audience favourite. They will also get a trophy and they will know forever that they were your champion. Uh, by the way, the audience favourite can be the same person that the judges have chosen as either their champion or the judges runner-up, right? The decisions are totally independent of each other. 
The audience vote will open after all the finalists have performed, so I suggest you jot down the name of your favourite speakers as we go along so you know who to vote for. Details on how to vote uh, are here, so you can then go and see that, and we'll, we'll let you know when we open it up. Right, that's it. That's how it works. Before we get started, there's one more thing. Technology is often a bit of a pain in the derriere, right? That's for, uh, <laughs> that's for our French-speaking fame lovers. So we've actually pre-recorded our 10 finalists' presentations. That feels like the fairest way to do it, so the internet signal doesn't affect anything. I hope you agree. Last week, all 10 finalists and our three judges jumped on a big old video call. They each presented for three minutes. The judges listened, and the judges put their follow-up questions to them. However, that's as far as we went, right? The judges deliberated after the final presentation. They made their decisions about the runners-up and the champion, but they did not tell the finalists or me. So tonight, you will get to watch those 10 presentations without the internet wobbles, and then, after all those, we will all get to find out together who wins. Plus, there's the audience vote, of course. And to give you some time to cast your vote for the audience vote, there will be a sciencey quiz. It is time to crack on, though. Let's meet the three people who will decide our finalists' fate. Here are our three judges and what they're looking for in our finalists' presentations. Hello, I am Eduardo, Eduardo Sainz de Cabezón, that's my full name. I come from Spain, I'm a mathematician, and I also speak about science in television, in YouTube or in media, and I took part in FameLab in 2013. Hi, I'm John Chase. Um, I'm a professional science communicator. Um, I studied it and I studied a few other degrees before that. And now I go around uh, doing shows, workshops uh, to the public in any which way I can. Um, I do a few things on YouTube and educational programs. Um, but a special thing that I do is I write raps about science. And so I'm considered as a science rapper. Um, I've been doing that for more than 10 years now. The first one I've done was actually for NASA, which was cool. Um, but now I do mostly shows, um, I do a bit of writing, um, and I like to combine popular stuff with science. So the science of Star Wars, the science of Roald Dahl even, the science of Harry Potter, things like that. So uh, that's me. Hi, my name is Roma Agrawal. I am a structural engineer with a physics degree. I've worked as a structural engineer for about 15 years and I was involved in the construction of the Shard, which is the tallest building in Western Europe. Um, most recently, I've been writing full time. I've written a book called Built that came out a couple of years ago. I've got a children's book coming out next year and I do documentaries and podcasts and films and you know, anything really to make people um, appreciate all the amazing engineering that's around them. So what I'm looking for in this final today is how you're able to make your content, your science, your topic together with the audience and what kind of magic happens when they come together. So how you're bringing your content to the audience or how you're bringing your audience to the content and what happens when they are together thanks to your talk. So I know that all of you come from a huge range of different science, engineering, mathematical backgrounds. Um, you know, clearly I'm not an expert in all of them. And what I want to see is how clearly you can explain these complex principles and the complex science that you're talking about so that um, even the structural engineer can understand it. So what I'll especially be looking for is charisma. I want to see how you carry that information to your audience. Um, do we feel like we're with you on this journey? Do we feel like we're excited to be with you on this journey? Or that you're dragging us along by our heels and we're going, no, please don't! Um, so I want to see your charisma, I want to see your personality, I want to see your energy. And energy doesn't mean you have to be excited and over the top, it just means that you're confident and comfortable in what you've got to say and you genuinely feel like you've got a passion for it and you're going to get that across to us. John, Roma, Eduardo, thank you so much for taking on the challenge of judging our fantastic finalists. Now, before we hear from them, let's say a quick hello to some of you lot watching live. Um, so many messages coming in. Uh, Susie Gage has tweeted good luck to all the finalists. Nice one. Cheers, Susie. Uh, Romania and Egypt and Qatar are here. Uh, Bulgaria and South Africa. Um, Desa from the Czech Republic says good luck. We've got Lucia says hello from Brazil. Hello. Uh, FameLab Ireland are in the house. They send their best wishes to all the finalists. Ziad as well says this sounds like a really interesting competition. Very excited to watch. 
Nice one. Um, hello, hello to everyone. Now, send over your thoughts on our finalist presentations too. Let me know what you're enjoying, what fact blew your mind, what prop you love. Keep those shout outs coming out as well. For uh, whoever you are, let me know where you are, where you're watching from. I'll squeeze in as many as I can. Let's do it then. It's time to hear our first finalist's presentation. Tonight's order was chosen by random and kicking us off is Cody Freer representing Australia. Now Cody is a PhD researcher at the University of Queensland and based on his semi-final talk he knows a lot about Teletubbies and vacuum cleaners. So what will today's talk be on? Will it be uh, SpongeBob SquarePants washing machine? Will it be the Simpsons donut maker? Well he is calling it skin in the game and he's got three minutes Go Cody. Bust out your sweat bands and loosen up your limbs because you are about to be immersed in one of the greatest competitions of all time. What? What? No, 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 stop, stop, no, no, go away, no, stop. No, what I'm talking about is wound healing and burn injuries. But the burn wound is like an Olympic arena filled with elite athletes. Except instead of duking it out for medals, these athletes dictate whether a patient recovers quickly or has to contend with a lifetime of disability. Within moments of the injury, they stream in from the Olympic village and the surrounding tissue. First, you have the platelets and clotting factors, blood-stopping wrestlers heaving to staunch the flow from damaged vessels. Next are the inflammatory cells. These are the boxers, punching away debris and infectious agents. Then the true stars make their appearance, the fibroblasts and the skin cells. The fibroblasts are the decathletes. They do a little bit of everything, shot putting collagen, throwing out growth factors, and pulling the wound edges closer together. The skin cells are the sprinters, the U-skin bolts, if you will, dashing in to cover up the wound. The fibroblasts and skin cells are pitched in a great race. Both need to perform well for effective healing, but we, we are firmly on team skin cell. Why? Because we have skin in the game. See, if the skin cells fall behind and take too long to cover the wound, the fibroblasts take a victory lap, spiking down more and more collagen. What often results is a permanent scar. And for children especially, scarring can be a major burden affecting their psychological and physical development. Take the case of Jack, an avid rugby player who at a young age sustained a burn to his neck that resulted in severe scarring. Over the years, Jack continued to grow, but the scar tissue couldn't keep up. He had to undergo multiple reconstructive operations because the scar was making him strain to even look up to see the rugby ball in the air. So how can we improve outcomes for children like Jack? Well, in my research, I've identified two beneficial treatments. The first is appropriately first aid, consisting of 20 minutes of cool running water. This basic intervention serves as a referee, maintaining order in the wound arena and thereby decreasing wound depth and accelerating healing. The second is a vacuum-based dressing called negative pressure wound therapy. In a clinical trial I performed, negative pressure accelerated healing and reduced the risk of long-term scar management. It did so by acting like a hybrid cleanup crew and coach, keeping the path clear for the skin cells and pushing them to victory. In the fierce race that is burn wound healing, first aid and negative pressure might just give the skin cells and our young patients a competitive edge. They're another step closer to ensuring that children like Jack can look up without difficulty and look ahead to a future without scarring. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Cody, for your talk. Uh, it was a very interesting topic. I have a question, I have a, a curiosity. I don't know if you can uh, know something about this. I'm always very curious about what we learn in science in general uh, from animals, from nature. And some animals and some uh, creatures in in our environment have a very good uh, have very good are very good at healing themselves and uh, nothing in Wolverine right now but more similar to us animals so are we in medicine or in science learning from animals on how to uh, heal better how to heal ourselves better 
You know, that is an excellent question. And I actually love this topic because a lot of wound healing studies uh, actually do uh, involve animal models. And that can be a little tricky because it can uh, provide a lot of useful information to develop new therapeutics. But there are some major differences between the animal models that are used to develop these new therapies and humans themselves. So if you look at the bulk of the animal model studies that are used um, or uh, that have been conducted in order to study burn wound healing, uh, they're actually done in mice and in rats. In mice and rats, differ substantially in terms of how they heal compared to humans. They have an additional layer uh, underneath their normal skin called the paniculus carnosis. And this actually contributes to contraction of the wound. So you know how I talked about the fibroblasts and the skin cells? You know, they're not as much of a contributor to wound healing in the mice and the rats as they are to humans because the paniculus carnosis actually contracts the wound and that's the primary mechanism by which these animals uh, actually heal. Uh, and so using these animal models in order to develop the new treatments uh, isn't always very helpful. And that's why we found that a lot of the treatments that have shown promise in these animal models have turned out to be a bust in humans. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Cody. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to present to us. I had a question about what the negative pressure um, dressing, I think you mentioned. Could you tell us a little bit about what that means and how it works? Yeah, absolutely. So it's called negative pressure wound therapy, and it uses a pump to apply a vacuum to the wound environment. And this is hypothesized to improve healing um, by exerting uh, a number of different effects on the local wound environment. And uh, most of these fall into four broad camps, or as I like to call them, the four S's. So stretch, suck, shield, and stimulate. Stretch, they stretch the wound margins closer together. Suck, they remove uh, uh, swelling from the environment. And by doing that, they decrease compression of the blood vessels. And by decreasing compression of the blood vessels, they improve the flow of nutrients and oxygen to those healing cells that need it. Shield, because it shields it, the wound from the external environment and maintains a nice human environment for those healing cells. And then stimulate. Uh, there's actually evidence that it acts on the wound bed and sets off chemical cascades that, re that result in the release of growth factors, improving the production of skin cells and of blood vessels. Thank you so much. Oh, what a strong start from Cody there. Loving the use of the Olympics as an analogy for wound healing. Lots of people in the live chat where as well I saw some comments. Uh, my favourite pun from that one was use skin bolt. Yes, round of applause. Um, a reminder, you are seeing pre-recorded presentations and judges Q&A, but we are all watching those live and that live chat is open. Um, <clears throat> Sam says, well done, Cody. Uh, Dream is back on, says, great start to the competition, go Cody. Amy says, that was such an interesting talk. Uh, Ngu Yen says, hello from Vietnam, watching the final for the first time. Hello, welcome. On to our second finalist then, and that is uh, Ga Yan Bu from Korea. Ga Yan is a PhD student researching biophysics at Pohang University of Science and Technology, POSTECH. She impressed uh, the judges in the semi-final with her explanation of optical tweezers. Today, though, she's talking about how to be a single molecule. Gayan, over to you. Hi, humans. I am a small protein in your body, molecular motor. I carry life activity in, around in your cells, such as kind of career. Actually, I am very tiny. So before the 1990s, it was impossible to observe me individually, even using a microscope. The only thing you could observe was the result that I and my friends' motor proteins had made. To put it very bluntly, you couldn't distinguish on individuals among people doing hundreds of people playing tug of war. The only thing you could see was where the rope had moved. However, the knowledge about working mechanism of individual what molecular motor is crucial for you guys, humans, because disordered us can result in various diseases like cancers. So humans 
have developed technology and they've gained the ability to distinguish one single molecular motor from another. At last, the era of a single molecule technique has arrived. In a nutshell, single molecule technique is putting a giant glittering bracelet to onto the one of Tugover members making it easier to distinguish the player with this proconscious accessory. And, scientists, and using this single molecule technique, scientists discover much more personalities about we motor protein. For example, researchers can see that I walk around with a regular step size, just like you humans. But unlike you, most of the humans, I'm shaken terribly when neighboring water molecules come and hit me. Now I am deeply understood. If it wasn't for the single molecule technique, I and my team of um, tug of war team members can only be observed as one giant blob. Our weevils and wobbles are cancelled out by each other, and my independent heaves and holes are drowned out by the groans of the others. I am happy to be distinguished from others and to reveal my true character using the single molecule technique. Hey humans, what about you? Do others know you each through you? Um, well, people who love me know me, but sometimes I feel also like not me, rather just a component of a group. For example, I'm considered a woman who is weak and delicate. I'm considered a Korean who is good at math, and I'm considered as a scientist, a typical nerd. But first, of course, if hundreds of women and men did tug of war, the rope may go to the men's side. Um, but some of women, like me, may be stronger than some of men. And second, the Korean average math score may be high, but I am terrible at math. And third, I study science, but am I a nerd? Ah, uh, maybe. So the properties of a group do not necessarily represent the unique in characteristic of the individual inside it. Despite this, we consistently categorizing the world just because it makes us feel more comfortable. However, this only gives us the misconception that everything is predictable and it generates tenacious discrimination. What if we all decided to see others not as part of a group, but as a single entity? Then maybe, just maybe, we can start to see the truth which is hidden behind the prejudice. Thank you. Diane, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I am really interested to know a little bit more about the glittering star, so I want to know what is that star when you're doing your science? Okay, the essential of the single molecular technique is distinguish one from others. So we tagged stars um, in real scientific word, fluorescent bead or fluorescent dyes or fluorescent proteins. Anyway, we can tag the fluorescent light molecule to the proteins we want to know so we can um, observe these and track this molecule's movement and measure the speed for others thank you so much thank you hi again that was absolutely fantastic i loved your analogy and use of the clips um i wanted to ask um so before they had this technique um how how so for example, how has this technique changed the face of for example medicine or um, what benefit does it have um, to uh, in the in the laboratory um, okay I 
um, because single molecule techniques is a kind of concept, not a specific technique. Um, it, uh, com it includes lots of techniques. And before the single molecule technique, um, the major, major research about biomolecules are ensemble um, experiment. We call it ensemble. That means uh, we just can we just could see, could see the ensemble group of proteins at once, but we cannot know their individual speed or their individual properties with ensemble experiment. So um, after the single molecular technique has advanced, uh, we can know that there are different types of those groups, ensemble groups. So we can distinguish the groups or, um, yes, the type and more exact properties of the molecules. Thank you. Very, very well done. Look, what the question may be, I'm feeling a bit sorry that Guyan, you, you, you're not that good at math. So if you want some help, I'm here to help with your math. Uh, but there's something I would like to know about your research is uh, since we know now more the individual aspects of the cells from these individual aspects can we also gain some insight on the collective aspects that we didn't know before maybe yes of course because when we when you try to explain something we need some numbers parameters and exact getting the exact parameters is very important in science field and if we see the individuals then we can get exact parameters from them so in that aspect the in the, uh, single molecular technique is very very important to um, also see the group properties thank you thank you great answer Fantastic. I really want to see who would win that bulldog clip tug of war. Um, that's what we call those clips, bulldog clips. I particularly loved Guyon's line, um, the properties of a group do not necessarily represent the unique characteristics of the individual. Yeah. And then, you know, she said that can lead to discrimination. We need to celebrate individuality. Thank you, Guyon. Right, let's have a look at some comments. Um, Amy wants to know if there's an award for the cutest props. I mean, why not? We can make that a thing, just between us. Um, Ranim says the props are really helping. Uh, lots of love for the props, uh, especially for little smiley faces on the clips. Uh, Loy Bov says stationery will never be the same again. <laughs> uh, Tara loves uh, Guyon's approach to explaining the concept. Pinky, fellow fame labber, you'll see very soon, uh, says well done, Guyon. Uh, Sun Guy says Guyon's really taught him about small, small things. Um, and uh, AEH123 uh, really admires all of the participants whose first language isn't English, it's a real skill to be able to communicate so well in their second or third language. Very good point. Um, thank you. Now, if you've just joined us, welcome to the FameLab International Final 2020. A reminder that you will get to vote for the audience vote winner after all the finalists have performed. Um, our third finalist is about to take to our virtual stage. She is Rebecca Ellis from the UK. Rebecca is a PhD student researching care pathways for autism at Swansea University in Wales. I've got a few FameLab final facts for you during the show. Um, Rebecca shares a birthday with Pinky, our South African finalist. And Rebecca is going to present her fifth original SciComm spoken word piece now. If there was an autism care pathway with clear, precise steps from assessment and diagnosis, no matter how complex, to post-diagnostic support, the whole process, we could dramatically reduce a family's stress. Since autism is neurodevelopmentally complex with differences in representation in sex, it makes sense to combine all the knowledge we can to co-produce an integrated cross-agency care plan. But research of mine noted a discrepancy. When defining care pathways, there's no uniformity. Let's think about the care pathway steps we take from assessment to diagnosis and make no mistake, these steps are important, but when it comes to the end, post-diagnostic support is independent. Good luck, my friend. 
Now, systems and models have been designed to take these subsystems and have them combined into a larger pathway. But surely, I thought, those pathways should show some type of empirical support and detail their teams, the doctors, the clinicians. Ah, but all that depends on your pathway definition. See, I think a pathway should be explained bit by bit, detailing who is involved and where the families fit. No matter how much we discuss, though, academically, throwing key terms around like multidisciplinary, the empirical data is lacking, but seems to show that implementation is weak and communication is slow. I've got questions for parents that have popped online, hoping the government's pathways and theirs align. I ask who's involved in your process, what's working for you? Is there a key worker or someone for you to talk it through? After that, I do interviews, an information collector, an inspector, maybe connector of those in the third sector. Those were the stages of the plan, at least. The third week in March, when my questionnaire was released. The more astute amongst you may have already clocked. That's when quarantine began and my office was locked. The questionnaire was online, so it could still be ongoing. Participating numbers of parents, however, was slowing. Turns out having kids at home is not conducive to having spare time. Makes participants elusive. Change my tactics, change my ethics, change this poem. Participants pick up when schools reopen. Initial results suggest that despite improvements made, some of the barriers to care have stayed. Despite the focus on integration in the current rhetoric, communication is lacking and transitions aren't slick. In terms of information, there's hardly legions and there's differences in professionals across Welsh regions. Next is interviews from home, not just more evaluation, get more suggestions for improvement and its implementation. It's been a year, but it's still my full intention to develop this holistic whole system intervention. Research in the days of COVID is not for the faint hearted, but it's important work. So let's finish what we started. Thank you. That was fantastic, Rebecca. Um, can I say, obviously, I'm, I'm a science rapper, so hearing you do all of that in rhyme just made me go, whoo, because it's right down my alley. Um, so obviously you talk a lot about autism and um, you're currently, if I'm getting this right, you're currently doing research involving the public to find out um, the state of, 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 of their situation. Um, so obviously with COVID kicking in now, um, how far are you through your research and how far may this set you back, do you believe? So my questionnaire went out to parents in the third week of March, wanting to understand the elements of their care pathway that was working for their autistic child, what needed improvement, and what those improvements might actually look like. Unfortunately, when you go into lockdown and parents had their autistic children at home, the children were now having to deal with change that couldn't be explained to them. Obviously, they can't be given a deadline as to when this will stop and that would cause, that might cause a significant amount of stress. I know that it did for myself. So I can imagine that the parents had their hands full and therefore, unfortunately, I had to keep my questionnaire open long enough to get enough respondents. Unfortunately, my questionnaire was going to be, give me the data to base my interview questions on. And if I didn't have the data, I couldn't start my interviews. So that was pushed back again and I had to change a lot of things. So I managed to start the interviews sometime around last month, six weeks ago, and the second lockdown kicked in. So it was the exact same problems again. But I think researchers and I think parents of autistic children are both known to be incredibly resilient. So this data is going to be collected. It's going to take a little bit longer, maybe four or five months, I think, has been impacted in terms of my work. But we're going to get there and we're going to get it done because it's very important research, in my opinion. Fantastic. So it was great to hear you. Uh... Uh, poets, I would say. It's, it's, it, it was great. It was, it was really a delight. And I'm, I have a question, maybe not really or directly related to your actual research, but I do work in computers in school and in particular for, say, uh, adaptation technologies and so on. And my question always is, in what sense are computers a good tool for integration of all children in school or are they the opposite? I think
think computers are very beneficial, actually. I think that the younger generations have a lot of access to their phones, their computers, their laptops. And if anything, in science communication, we should be making science more accessible. We've got this idea in our heads, and I don't know where it came from, of what a scientist is. You know, it's a person on their own, maybe in a lab coat in a basement somewhere, looking very closely at a pipette. And that's not at all accessible to people who want to get into science. So I think that we need to challenge what a scientist is, what a scientist looks like. And one of the ways we can do that is by effective communication through a method in which is accessible to a large number of people. And I think computers, social media and technology such as that has been incredibly important, especially during COVID, when it's all we've had to connect with each other. I think it is one of the main things that we could get into as scientists in order to promote our research further and to a wider, diverse population. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you so much for your presentation. And what I would love to ask you is why you chose this particular rap or poetry style to communicate your message. So once again, there's this idea of what a scientist is, but there's also this idea that science and creativity are somehow separate and that science has to be very serious. But in actual fact, a lot of scientists are creative and a lot of creative people are scientists. Think about COVID. No one has not talked about COVID since March, I can assure you. So we're all science communicators in that respect. I think I wanted to combine the creative and scientific elements of myself to challenge the idea of what a scientist looks like. And I wanted to give myself also a bit of a challenge and to just do something unique and combine those elements of my personality that I had. I had to get over imposter syndrome and thinking that I wasn't a real scientist to do this. And the response from people combining the creative and the scientific has just reinforced to me that this is the way that I want to do things. I want to be accessible. I want to make science fun. And I'm incorporating a creative element now into my PhD where I'm actually drawing out visual representations of my pathways as described by parents. So I've incorporated creativity into my thesis now, and I think it brings the whole person into the research and that can be nothing but enriching. Thank you. I wish you all the very best with it. Thank you very much. Hello up there. Hi, we just thought we'd give you a little view of our fancy studio setup for the final here. Um, I'll come to you though. Thank you, Rebecca, for your rhyming reflections on research in the days of COVID. Um, so many comments through. Nunkar says, these are all great, great communicators. Oh, the finalists are amazing this year. In fact, they always are. Uh, Galia loves the poetic style, says it's so interesting. Uh, Gabriella says she's amazing and she rhymes. Heba from Qatar says, go wonderful communicators. Um, Shia Ma says, OMG, we have a scientist rapper from the UK, impressive. Uh, Juliana put lots of clapping hands emojis, as did Yasmina, as did lots of you, in fact. Um, Ahmed says this is a revolutionary style of science communication. Um, also, quite a few of you spotting that Rebecca having a bit of fun there, changing mugs between each question of the judges. So well done to you lot if you spotted that. Um, what else we got? Ranine says, let's change how people think scientists look. Nice, we'll end with that one. Um, a reminder that although the judges will choose the runners-up and the champion, you get to crown your audience favourite. And the vote for that will open after all ten finalists have performed. Next up is Shuradeep Majumba, representing Switzerland. Shuradeep is a PhD researcher in chemical engineering at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. Uh, he's also a guitarist, a vocalist and a Bollywood dance instructor. Let's see if that will make an appearance in his talk. Sir Adi. Hello everyone. As you're watching me across your screens, take a moment and have a look at all the materials around you. For example, the very chairs on which you're sitting right now. Now close your eyes and imagine that you have a superpower of going inside the material of the chair and entering into a world of millions of atoms and molecules. Fascinating, isn't it? 
is the arrangement of these atoms and molecules in a particular fashion which gives rise to a chair, right? Now imagine if we could rearrange all these atoms and molecules and design the material of our choice to solve some of our most complicated problems. How amazing would that be? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is how some scientists are trying to combat one of our biggest global challenges, climate change. Now you see, the main reason behind climate change is the rising emissions of carbon dioxide or CO2. Therefore, we are trying to make new materials which can attract the CO2 molecules and capture them. Now these materials are nanomaterials. Nano, which means they are about a billion times smaller than your chair. So we can't see them with our naked eyes. But if we go deep inside their world, they would look something like this. So these materials are made up of atoms of several elements which are found all around us in nature. Like iron, copper, zinc, etc. Now you must be thinking that how do we design such a material which is good enough to attract CO2? Well, one very effective way of doing it is by using the power of modern computers. I am talking about a field of science called molecular modeling where we use computational models to study the behavior of atoms and molecules. For example, which atoms should we use to build our material? Copper? Zinc? Something else? How should we place them? At what distance and angle so that the force of attraction between our material and CO2 is maximum? All these complex calculations can be performed using computer simulations. And the advantage of this method is that we can design not just one, but millions of such materials and then predict which are the best ones for capturing CO2. Or in simple words, we can design a roadmap to search for the best materials for carbon capture so that industries can then put these materials into practice and together we can all contribute towards making our planet a safer place for our future generations. I am Shorodhi, a researcher in this field and all that I want to convey to you is that the clocks are ticking and we are already running late. So let's hurry up and make some materials to capture this CO2 before it captures us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Radeep. That was a great talk and a great topic. I like the topic. And I was thinking as you were speaking, in particular the last time of your talk, uh, I was thinking how long is the way be between your designing a material in a computer, like a computer molecule design, etc., to actual production of the material? I mean, you, with your computer you may be just design whatever you wish, but then you have to really produce it, translate it into an actual molecule, being able to build it and, and being able to use it. So how long is this way? Yes. So this is what we are doing with computer simulation. So from an experimental point of view, testing, synthesizing of material, even for one material, can take say up to some, some months, say two, three months for one material. But doing it for so many materials experimentally is not a viable option. Therefore with computer simulations, I am performing these calculations and I am identifying which are the best candidates for CO2 capture. Because there are a lot of properties which are needed for this material which is stable enough, it can, has a high uptake for CO2, it is selective towards CO2 and not the other gases. So by uh, calculating all these properties, I have my experimental team where, where I can pass on this material list that hey, uh, these are the 100 most promising materials out of the millions. They can now then focus on synthesizing these materials the way they do, but obviously the time is now reduced from several years to maybe so some months. So one material can take uh, a few months and then if we just uh, focus on the promising material, it is in order of months and our entire process is becoming far shorter. And then we also have our industrial collaborators where we can pass on this material list and they can test in their real conditions. This is how we are working in collaboration. Great, great job, thank you. Thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating, Shuradeep. And I, I've got to say, my mind was just whizzing forward. So um, I'm, I'm a bit of a science fiction geek, I, I love it. And what I gathered from, from what you're saying is that you could almost impregnate any material with things to capture carbon. Um, and so I wonder, like I have visions of painting buildings with a paint with, with some of these materials in. Um, but I wonder what do you envision as the future of the technologies that can come out as a result of this? 
as a result of uh, designing these materials. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So this is a very interesting uh, feature of this material. So we can actually tune the properties of these materials. For example, these holes. The CO2 gets uh, uh, captured in these holes. So how much of diameter should we keep these holes? What type of atom should we use so that it is cheap, it is abundant, so that we can make it uh, in the laboratory in a faster process. All these properties, we can tune these materials, we can optimize the best material and then we can pass on these material lists to uh, our uh, colleagues. So this entire process of uh, uh, material discovery through computation, this is like a new field which is not relatively uh, till old in, in the field of material discovery, but this is really accelerating the process for discovering these materials. And I'm sure uh, these materials are only 20 years old in their existence, but within 20 years they have shown a tremendous promise in capturing CO2. So the time is not far when in the next few years it's just about uh, upscaling the processes from the lab to the industries where we can design these materials and you see these materials in practice in power plants actually capturing CO2. So I'm quite excited about the future of this. Fantastic, thank you. Hi Shirley, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, my question is what happens once, like say your the little model that you have is now full of carbon, of CO2, what happens to the material after that? Yes, so once the CO2 is captured onto this material, we can then pull the CO2 out of it and store it underground in geological storages. So we can put this CO2 underground and this material is now free of CO2. So we can use this material once again. And that is what we aim to do. We've, this is another property we, I use when I'm uh, selecting my materials. That to our, for a process to be energy and cost efficient, we want this material to be reused several times. For example, if you have a material which is really good at attracting CO2, but then it does not release the CO2, it keeps it attracted towards itself, then it's not a good material because you're not being able to reuse it. You have to throw it away. But we want to reuse this material again. So the CO2 goes underground, the material is reused again. Thank you so much. That's totally answered my question. Thank you. Molecular modeling, the best materials for carbon capture. Super interesting. However, no dancing. Did request it. Uh, anyway, as he says, the clock is ticking. We are now 40% of the way through the final, sadly. Loads of comments coming in. Thank you so, so much. Um, let's have a look. Uh, Charithea just says, wow. Fair, yeah, fair. Uh, Two Doors says this is absolutely fascinating. Yasmina is so impressed and loves his idea. Uh, Maddie says Greg is looking snazzy. Thanks, Mads. Um, Mahmood thinks the presentation was electric and engaging. Uh, Kak loves the passion. Santri says it's amazing how he explains such a complex topic in a way that's so easy to understand. Um, oh, and this is what I love about FameLab. It becomes such a community and such a family. So we've got Dimitri, who's a previous finalist for Switzerland, says, well done, mate. Uh, and over on Twitter, we've got former FameLabber Emma Weinall sends loads of luck to the FameLab competitors, says it's brilliant to still be part of the family. Love that. So our fifth international finalist is Ataleth Don Peris from Malaysia. Don has a master's degree in oceanography and works in marine conservation. His semi-final performance featured an impression of Gandalf. So I've got my fingers crossed for, what, Gollum this time? Hmm. Let's find out. Atleth. Can you recall the last time you were captivated by nature? Was it the majestic view of a snowy mountain range? Or was it the smell of a refreshing sea breeze with a soft sandy beach under your feet? But now imagine if that's not the experience that nature gives, where instead what you get is the overwhelming smell of a rotten egg. Now your feet are stuck deep into mud. You're surrounded by weird growing trees with its dense exposed roots that are both unwelcoming and inaccessible. So would you still be captivated? Ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what it feels like being in a mangrove forest. It smells, it's dirty, inaccessible, and sometimes creepy. If you think about it, it sounds like a place where evil witches would go to hang out, right? Which is probably the reason why mangroves are being destroyed at a rate two times faster than any terrestrial forest on earth, being seen as nothing more but a wasteland. They were converted into other land use with potentially higher economic value. But now, as small research begins to focus on understanding the ecological significance of mangroves, 
we also begin to see the true beauty of mangroves through the lens of science, which is the beauty of a home, a home to the migratory birds that seek refuge and rest during rough weather. Even a small juvenile fish, they seek protection in its dense root system underwater, while the muddy ground during low tide is a social site for male crabs to mingle with the ladies, because even crabs need romance, apparently. But you see, mangrove is not just a home. It is a home with storage capability. You see, in a mangrove, the smell is actually a sign of decaying, uh, decaying organic matter in a low oxygen environment. But because it is such a slow process, it would eventually just piles up throughout the years um, along with all its natural carbon materials. Hence, reducing the amount of CO2 being released out into the uh, environment a crucial natural process that's helping us to fight against climate change. But the services provided by Mangrove is not just limited to those who live within, but also beyond, which is why we're seeing a lot of coastal communities relying on them for their source, for the source of culture as well as livelihood, contributing greatly towards their social, economy, and even environment. Ladies and gentlemen, working with nature made me realize that the beauty of mangroves cannot be seen like how we see each other how we look, how we smell, appearance, this and that. The beauty of mangroves can only be measured by how much life that lives within it, it sustains, it protects, provides and secures. A beauty that can only be seen beyond our biased human senses. Thank you. Hi Atalath again, thank you so much for your very interesting presentation. Um, can you tell me a bit about how you do your research and do you get to visit these mangrove forests? Do you take samples? You know, what, what is the kind of research that you're doing? Well, actually, during my master's degree, which is like, just graduated last year, I studied on the dispersal of mangrove propagules and seeing how does as mangrove propagule and how could it naturally disperse and establish uh, into a newer ground. And from what I uh, uh, the experience basically being in a mangrove, it's exactly how I've presented. Um, uh, because every mangrove have a different kind of environment. Some mangroves have no mosquitoes, but some mangroves have a lot of mosquitoes. And most of the time when we talk about being in a mangrove, the pleasant part is being in a boat on a cruise along the river. But no one have actually have the hands-on experience, like enjoy the experience of being in the ground, in the mud, knee deep, and picking up samples of core samples, could even be propagule samples, this and that. So um, most of my research focus on um, combining those dispersal element as well as hydrological cycle as well. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. I have a curious, yeah, I have a question uh, for you, Athlet. Yes. Um, I know that mangroves are um, very important in, the, in climate change because of their ability to capture CO2. And my question is, from, some, some of, from your point of view, how are they being managed? How, what is being done to preserve these, these mangroves forests and um, yeah, to preserve them, to, how to keep them alive so that they can help us in a climate change fight? Well, Actually, that's a lot of work being done. And it's not just mangrove because mangrove itself is just part of a uh, bigger, um, bigger ecosystem, which is part of a wetland itself. In a wetland, there's mangrove, that's, yeah, that's peatlands, there's shrubs, this and that, right? But in terms of how other work and that we can do is basically, we have to firstly differentiate between conservation and forest management. Uh, conservation basically, keeping mangroves in a, that particular area with specific um, special habitat or animal as it is. Whereas forest management basically um, balance out the need for local, um, basically for the local economy and in terms of continuous uh, of the forest management throughout the future. Because there are some areas where there's heavy reliance of the community towards the forest, right? So we can't ignore that, it would be insensitive to do that. But also at the same time, how do we balance between um, harvesting those resources at the same time, making sure that the, um, those resources could sustain throughout the year or in the future. So of course, um, those are the things that to me, I would really focus on whether differentiated with conservation and proper forest management, depend on areas that we want to work on, I would say. Thank you very much, very important topic, thanks. And just a quick question. So, 
I loved your use of narrative and the way you brought us in at the start. And I just want to ask you, what do you feel is the most important thing to communicate to the public? Do you think it is the beauty of nature or the understanding of nature or something else? Um, the reason why I talk about beauty in the first place is because when it comes to ecosystem, we always talk about, you know, corals being colorful, the beach being uh, refreshing, this and that. But sometimes, but when it comes to mangrove, of course, we enjoy the boat cruise throughout the river. Um, it's not something that we take a, we're going to update the picture in our, in our two piece, right? Being in a knee deep mud and so on. But uh, the reason why I would say that is because sometimes uh, for na nature is not defined by how we see beauty, right? Nature is not defined by um, the smell. It doesn't matter whether it smells, it doesn't matter whether it's unpleasant to us. What matters is it for, it for it to continue to sustain those life and uh, plant and animal that relies on that ecosystem, a complex ecosystem where everyone function in a balanced uh, in a balanced way and continue perform all the ecological function like coastal protection and coastal protection as well as um, oh some of the carbon uh, carbon storage and so on. So all of the things are not necessarily pleasant to us, but it's a necessary process, which means it goes beyond uh, what is beauty and uh, what is pleasant basically. Fantastic. Well, there you go. Now you know that Don's favourite place in the world smells like rotten eggs. And if you went there, you'd probably lose a boot in the mud. Um, awesome. Uh, let's have a look. I, I do share your love of mangroves though, Don, so thank you so, so much. Let's have a look. So many comments still. This is amazing. Uh, Rita, love the background and the, and the content, I'm sure. Um, Muano says, hashtag captivating. Uh, Aya says, powerful opening. Amy says, justice for crab romance. <laughs> and Tara says, such an important topic. So much more uh, to talk about and to do on marine conservation. Uh, Mohammed, said, <laughs> Mohammed said, this is definitely one of his favorite talks. See what you've done there. Anyone who puts a pun in their comment, that's gonna get read out, just saying. Yusef says, truly a great choice of topic. Clara says it was beautiful. Uh, Nath says, come to Brazil, visit our mangroves. Uh, people saying they will not see mangroves again in the same light. Uh, and people inviting you to come and speak to their students as well. And loads of, loads of emojis. So thank you so, so much. We're now halfway through our international finalists. Sad times. Right, on to Shokista Isma Ajanova from Kazakhstan. Now, many of our finalists speak more than one language. But the prize for the most spoken goes to Shokista, who speaks six, making her hexalingual, I think. Shokista is a medical student at Nazarbayev University, and she's hoping to do a PhD in neuroscience. She's the first participant from Kazakhstan to reach a FameLab final, and her three minutes starts after the swoosh. What if I told you 2020 has been a fantastic year? Would you agree with me? If I tell you, my journey started in Wuhan in 2019, December, and I've been traveling all around the world, enjoying my life, and I don't really care about quarantine measures, travel restrictions, and about social distancing. And by now, you probably recognize me. I am Mrs. Coronavirus, better known as COVID-19. I'm not a typical virus. I am a super virus. I infected more than 55 million people worldwide in a year. And I can make people sick. I can make people die. And I'm everywhere and no one can see me. And I of course, love all the public places, crowded places, and I love when people touch their faces, eyes, nose, and mouth, because that creates a great opportunity to travel to my next destination, which is human lungs. For me, human lungs are just like a five-star hotel where I am the VIP guest. And once inside the lungs, I use my corona receptors, which are just like keys to get inside. Next, silly lung cells, which are unaware of what's truly happening, execute all of my instructions. My instructions are simple. 
copy and reassemble more viruses. And when there is just enough number of viruses, I give my final order to lung cells, kill yourself, so that newly produced viruses can spread beyond one lung, one lung cell and spread to more lungs. So in that way, I cause severe injury to the lungs and people become short of breath. Unfortunately, I experienced a few bumps on my way, like government officials telling people wear masks, wash your hands, and I really hate when they do that. Now, I'm even more scared because people are using dreaded V word, V not for virus, but vaccine. And I'm so much concerned, but I want to travel and spread my virus more to more and more places. So I ask for your help. Please help me hug each other, shake hands with, with each other, and even better, shake hands with me. Thank you, Shakista. That was absolutely fantastic. And um, what should I say? COVID-19. Actually, from now, I'm going to address you as COVID-19 because I've got really good... This coronavirus, you can address like this. Ah, oh, fantastic. So, coronavirus, can I ask, how adaptable are you? So when you land in different places, for example, um, and people send up the vicious V for you, the vaccine, um, how adaptable are you um, around those vaccines? I am actually, you know, I'm very vibrant. I am very dynamic and I can make so many mutations. I make mutations very frequently. And uh, I hope even when there is a vaccine, I will still be making some more mutations and survive in very hostile environment of humans. Thank you. Um, hello, Mrs. Coronavirus. You have been quite difficult for all of us this year, I have to say. Um, I also want to know how many cousins do you have? You know, who else are we going to get to meet in the next few years? Oh, I can tell only about the past because I cannot predict the future, you know, and I don't want to tell my secrets yet. So I have cousins um, who also caused a very much problem in the past, like in 1993 in different countries, and I will reveal only those secrets. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to say that I cannot share all of the details about our future because we want to survive, you know, we are also uh, like wanting to live. Uh, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that. <laughs> Thank you. I have, I have a little question for, for you. Uh, Shakista, thank, thank you for your, for your talk. That was great, Miss Coronavirus. And uh, my talk is about the, the way you try to communicate your science. So there is in, in Spain, there is a Twitter account, uh, which is Coronavirus. It's a fake parody account, which has uh, close to a million followers so far. And it's, very, it's been very successful in communicating a delicate matter, matter with humor. So what are your thoughts about that? How, what do you think about how is it to communicate some delicate matters like coronavirus with, using humor? Mm. Uh, can you specify, like uh, rephrase your question? Yeah, so ma some people may, may think that uh, using humor for communicating things that are so delicate is not the right thing to do. But what are your thoughts about this? Because it is quite a successful and I agree with that. Uh, I think it's one of the like greatest ways uh, of communicating because you know people are especially at uh, like at this time uh, people are all like very unhappy maybe because of the isolation and uh, you know there is there should be some sort of uh, joy maybe inspiration laughter so that people actually get the information like you know people are tired of giving like uh, being given commands and uh, you know that really makes everybody exhausted. But I think it's much fun, f more fun and easier to explain them in, in another, like, perspective, from another perspective. Okay, thank you. Well done. <laughs> Shakista, you are forever going to be known as Mrs. Coronavirus. It's all in the, uh, in the chat.
Orange Ginger Moon, putting it in capitals, all sorts of people. <laughs> um, Sandy says that halfway through, it's great to see how well the finalists have handled the judges' questions. Uh, Ranim says, no, not coronavirus, but loves the crown. Uh, Adrian loves the presentation style. Rita just loves you. Um, Shak Zoza says, that was funny and engaging. Galia in Bulgaria says, so up to date and informative. Uh, Yasmina says, it's nice to hear the other side of the story. You've got my sympathy. Um, uh, and let's end with this one. Mohammed says, this talk will go viral. But um, brilliant. There we go. And a reminder, the audience vote will open after you've seen all 10 finalists' performances and there will be a sciencey quiz to give you time to vote. And actually, you need to choose your top three first. So not only do you need to keep your favourite in mind, you also need to think of the other two that would join them in the top three. More about that soon. Next up, we have Gabriela ramos Leal from Brazil. Gabby has a PhD in clinical and animal reproduction and is a professor of embryology at the Universidad Castelo Branco. She's the first Brazilian to get through to the final. She's the semi-final audience vote choice and she's one half of another FameLab finalist double birthday, this time with Mahmoud, who is coming up later. Over to you, Gabriela. Have you ever wished to stop the time? Maybe to keep a sweet memory or to freeze a precious moment? It sounds like fantasy, right? But what if I told you that it can't be done in real life? Well, it was discovered that the cold has this magical power. Yes, the cold can really freeze the time. <laughs> Do you want an example? Okay. Captain America. Yes, Captain America. According to the Marvel movies, he was an amazing soldier. But then he had an accident, sank into the ocean and got frozen for 70 years. But he came back. Handsome, powerful, in full force in all the Avengers movies as if not a single day had gone of his life. Captain America was frozen in time. But this is science fiction, right? Well, Captain America really is a fiction, but the power of cold is science. The cryopreservation technique is used a long time, and it's nothing more than a conservation by cold, by ice cold, and more specifically by a substance named liquid nitrogen. You know that feeling you have that you can't move in the cold? This is what happens with frozen structures, because low temperatures below zero degrees are able to stop the metabolism, which allows the preservation of these structures. We can't freeze an entire human being like in the move yet, but we already do that with smaller structures, such as a embryo, for example. So a small embryo can be frozen storage remaining viable for many years and when it's finally ready to be transferred to a womb its development will continue exactly where it's left off as if not a single day had gone exactly like captain america you know fiction really involves lots of creativity but sometimes that science part in the movies can have something of reality you can't stop the time when your little boy says his first word. But the crying preservation allows, for example, cancer patients to freeze their embryos and oocytes until they can fulfill the dream of becoming parents. So tell me, do you like the cold? Well, I live in Brazil, so here we have a hot weather. But when I watch movies with snow or cold winters, I became fascinated because I remember this magical power. Thank you. Well, hello, Gabriela, and thank you very much for your talk. That brings me memories from when I was in FameLab because Fergus McAuliffe, who won the FameLab competition the year I took part in, uh, he won with a monologue, with a talk about freezing and a, and a frog that uses the freezing to its ability to freezing to live. So it was it was a great talk. Uh, I have a question for you about this stopping time using cold. And is, uh, how is it 
Is this applicable to organ transplants or conservation of organs for organ transplants? Uh, is it useful for that? Okay, so, hi, <laughs> thank you for your question, yes, let me see, I'm an embryologist, so in my experience I just work with embryos and oocytes, we can freeze also cells, you know, but my experience is with embryo and oocytes, and I just wanted to bring this topic to FemLab because, you know, I love it so much, and for me, it's like it has superpowers, you know, it's like a magical power because it gives us so many possibilities and we can preserve uh, endangered species, for example, we can help, you know, improving the cattle production and we can also help people that have problems with fertility. So I don't have experience with uh, cells and other tissues, but my area is with, you know, oocytes, embryos, and sometimes spermatozoans, but I prefer to work with embryos. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, thank you very much. That's a superpower, yes. <laughs> yes, a superpower. Hi Gabriella, thank you so much and you really made me cry during your talk because my little baby is from a frozen embryo, so people like you have made, you know, changed my life, so thank you so much for your work. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the length because there's some controversies that I, I hear about how long can we be freezing embryos or eggs um, over time, so I would love to hear your views on that, thank you. Okay, so this is a really nice question and I know that the word forever doesn't look like scientific, but as long as you have that embryo in the lipogen nitrogen, you know, in that temperature, you can keep it there. So I would say forever, but it depends how long you can keep that embryo in that way. Of course, that is different from embryos to oocytes because, you know, embryos uh, have, uh, has lots of cells and oocytes is just one cell. And I didn't say that, but the, the process can cause damage, you know, it, it doesn't happen with Captain America because he's a hero and nothing happens with a hero, but when we're talking about real life, the process itself can cause damage in the cells. So an embryo has lots of cells and an oocyte is just one cell. So when you hurt some cells, you still have others to continue. And when you hurt so badly a oocyte, you can continue. So uh, the research are more touchable uh, right now, the reality of the cryopreservation is more touchable with embryos and all sides is still a challenge, you, you know, to improve it. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Um, just one quick question for me, Gabrielle. Yeah. Fantastic again. Um, um, I love the use of popular references as well. Um, Marvel, winner. Um, I just wanted to ask, what fascinates you most about the research that you do? I think that is it. It's about the possibilities to change the world, you know, because you can have, you can change a person's life as Homa. You can change, you know, uh, the, the environment when you are preserving a species that is endangered. And you can change the people's life when you are talking about animal production and dairy cattle and whatever and about improving this. So I believe uh, what makes me more happier about that is about the possibilities, you know, it's one biotech, just one biotech, and we can do so much with it, so I just love cryopreservation. I'm a hot weather person, I'm, I am, but I just love the codes in this sense. Yeah, you could come to the UK, <laughs> you'll get a lot of that. <laughs> I can confirm the UK is very, very cold today, yes. Um, <laughs> so Gabby says you can't freeze a whole human. So my question to you is what part would you get frozen? Lots of chat, lots of love for Gabby in the, uh, in the chat. It's going crazy. Uh, Tulio says she's the queen of science. Cac says loves the subject of the talk. Lots of Marvel fans in the chat as well, actually. Uh, the dreamer is giving up the face cream and investing in a new freezer as I speak. Uh, Julianne says, wow, crypto preservation. This theme is so important. Uh, Sungai says, your work creates families, Gabriella. Uh, all the best. Mohammed says, this talk is the coolest. Told you, all the puns, you get in. Um, Amy thinks she knows Gabriella's favorite song, Ice Ice Baby. Nice, well done. Uh, and here's the last one. Jill Holm says, passion, expression, great scientific concept and connection. Uh, love that. Right, 
a trio of FameLab finalists are left. The first one is Ahmed Mani from Qatar. Ahmed has a master's in computer science and teaches information and design technology. His semi-final talk used a whopping 13 homemade props. Will today's be similar? Let's find out. Over to you, Ahmed. It's the year 1943. The UK is still struggling in the war against the Nazi. But somewhere in an English country house, the court baker, Alan Turing and his friends are developing the bomb machine, the machine which will crack the German Enigma code and help win the war. Hi. This momentous event was only possible due to the science of cryptanalysis. Cryptanalysis is the science of analyzing and breaking codes. It aims to understand how they work and how to improve their encryption techniques. The most basic approach to decrypt a letter is known as brute force. This is to try all the possible combinations you can think of. Basic, but it can be effective. Remember, see the cybering from the semifinals? Well, by shifting down the alphabet one letter at a time, you will have 26 different combinations. Keep trying to resolve the right key to decrypt the message. And that's only one bit of encryption key, while in advanced ciphering methods, using 128-bit encryption keys, you will have this many possibilities to try. The other way to crack a message is to first analyze a code, assess how often a character or a phrase appears, and work back from there. This is known as frequency analysis. Back in the 19s, the Arabic mathematician Al Kindi studied all the possible combinations. He studied all the ciphering methods and he discovered that each language has its own pattern. From there, he established two principles. The first relies on the fact that each language has certain letters that appear more often. The second principle is to find a common word or a phrase that repeats a lot in a language. For example, the word the, which I have used 22 times so far. Using this idea, we can analyze the frequency of this word, which will allow us to decrypt the whole letter. These words are known to cryptographers as crypts. Well, different type of crypts. One of the most famous crypts was the infamous Nazi greeting, which facilitated Turing breaking the aforementioned Enigma code. Nowadays, there are even more techniques used by cryptographers. As the science keeps evolving every day, the majority of cryptanalysis work hard to find weaknesses in the system, and their research is used to improve or replace flawed algorithms. This ethical work allows us to save our emails safely, keep hackers away from our data, or even have an online meeting with nice people like you guys, but as with most things, there is a dark side. Thank you. Um, hi, Ahmad. Thank you so much for your presentation, and I enjoyed um, all your props. So I would love to hear um, a little more about the dark side. You know, what do you think are some of the challenges in the future? Um, maybe that can be used in, in a bad or a negative way. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's a possibility. As I mentioned, the majority of cryptanalysis keep the good work, but this technology could get into the wrong hands, and it did. And we would hear once in a while that once uh, that a politician got hacked his email or a politician got manipulated, this technology could get into the wrong hands and many, many, many incidents could happen. As long as they have the enough data and the right time, they could hack into anything. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Oh, I'm going to thank you very much for your talk and very well use, very good use of the props. That was uh, fantastic. I love that. Uh, well, you, you're speaking about um, cryptography and come, and come from a country who starts with a Q. So what about quantum computers in cryptography? I, I know there is a menace uh, that quantum computers can break RSA codes, so the codes we rely on. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? What's the role of quantum computers in the future of cryptography? 
That's that's a very good question, actually. The main challenge to this whole science is the quantum computers. For example, I mentioned that to, to break into a password that using one 28-bit encryption key, you'd need like millions of possibilities to try. And this is like a piece of cake for quantum computers, which can apply hundreds or billions or billions of operations in, in seconds. And matter of fact, you can all try this website to check like a prop of your password, like an example of your password, but not the actual password, and see how minutes or years it would take. But with quantum computers, everything will get changed. Well, thank you very much. I hope we are able to do some uh, quantum free or quantum secure cryptography. Thank you very much. That was great, Ahmad. I think like your use of like like you said before by Eduardo, your use of props and and everything you had surrounding you and the way you brought it out was almost like watching a magician. It was so slick. Um, so I've just got a question because you had a lot of content there and I love the fact that you didn't just talk about the here and now, you also talked about the history of the topic and how it developed and the different characters involved. So how important do you think that is in science communication to talk about the history and the development of the science that we use now and technology? As a teacher, that's usually what I do, like taking the students in a journey for the past and the future and show them where the science stops every once in a while. And that's like, give them the imagination to, to, to think or to, to go with the flow, you know? That helps them to, to use their imagination to understand very, very well and link anything around them to science. That's STEM education. Perfect. That was some epic prop choreography, wasn't it? What I want to know is did you have someone kind of behind the camera scrambling around passing you props? I'm, I'm going to ask him. And love John's question about the history too. I've got a science history podcast that tells the lesser known stories about well-known ideas and people. It's called Surprisingly Brilliant. Hashtag plug. I'm going to have a look. <laughs> um, lots of people saying, Ahmad, uh, you're a rock star, says, uh, says Kata. Uh, Kofi and others liked to spot a similarity in outfit. But there was yeah red jacket white shirt thing great choice clearly and um, Nati says he's confirmed that Ahmad is a, is a magician Amy says yep yeah, definitely got that vibe uh, Raneem's really enjoying watching um, their first ever fame lab they're never going to miss it again welcome um, Mohammed said oh Mohammed again look look at this what a cracking performance right crypt cracking brilliant uh, and Yasmina says even prepared a prop for his questions wow. Okay, so our penultimate finalist is Pinky Mokwena from South Africa. Now, Pinky is from one of the capitals of South Africa, Pretoria. She's a master's student at the Swanee, uh, the Swanee University of Technology. Uh, she sings and plays the guitar. Hang on, if she sings and plays the guitar, she needs to form a fame lab band with Shara Deep, right? Anyway, enough of me droning on. Over to you, Pinky. A friend's grandparents recently celebrated 61 years of marriage. And I, as a quintessential singleton that is navigating the turbulent waters of courtship in this postmodern world of dating apps and pandemics, could not help but marvel at the type of bond that connects two individuals in this special way. Well, to be honest, it wasn't that long until I remembered that I actually know of another type of Cupid's arrow commonly known as polar covalent bonding, which exists in organic chemistry as a catalyst for fueling strong relationships between various elements, such as in this case, fueling a powerful relationship between carbon and a couple of fluorines. Catapulted into existence through various man-arranged marriages for the purpose of creating convenience products, it is no surprise to me that this exchange has cemented itself in society over time. These organic chemicals known as poly and perfluoroalkyl substances boast of being oleophobic, that is, being resistant to oil. 
that which makes them great for non-stick cook cookware. No more of that scrubbing and scraping of pots and pans on end. Finally, bring on the hiatus. In addition to this, they are great for firefighting film foams as well as grease resistant containers such as our microwave popcorn boxes. But then again, as with any great powers, the responsibilities that often tag along are all the more monumental. This is because the vices that follow these benefits are often detrimental to society when they're indiscriminately discarded into our environments through their product carriers. Not only are they non-degradable in nature, but with their tendency to biomagnify, they can blend into the matrix of our water systems and there confuse the enemy that is our conventional water treatment techniques, which amplifies their toxicities. With this, the global community has sounded beep up, beep up, emergency signals to request the additional help. The need for affordable, simplistic, and eco-friendly remediation methods has become of high priority. While with all the health hazards that they introduce to humans upon contact, such as cancer, it makes absolute sense. That is why my research seeks to introduce or to combat the spreading of cons by making use of an equally organic material known as maize tassel. Found at the apex of any male maize plant, its superpower is that when it is ground to powder under optimized conditions in a filter, it has the internal properties that are perfect for chemically distorting these functional groups. With that, they're able to nullify their potency and save the day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pinky. Like that was absolutely engaging, and I, I loved you. You you used a lot of reference to uh, the applications of some of the technologies before, and some of the downsides, and why this this product, your research, is is changing the game, hopefully. But I'm interested in Mace Tackle. Um, so before the introduction of something like Mace Tackle, like a natural product to to solve an unnatural problem, um, how did we deal with things like that in our environment? Yeah, good question. So um, there's a thing known as um, granular activated carbon. So most people make use of that particular one. But the thing about it is that it's not readily available and it's expensive. So some communities, such as in South Africa, will not be able to access that. Um, so yeah, they, there's been a lot of use with that and stuff like reverse osmosis, which is also expensive. So methods that were used previously, um, for some of us, they're too expensive and we cannot access them freely or readily. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your presentation, Pinky. And I think you packed a lot of content in there, which was really fascinating. And I liked how you talked about the pros and cons of different technologies. And I just wondered, was there any danger or any disadvantage to using this natural maize powder in trying to combat this problem? Thankfully, none that we know of. Um, this is because maize tassel is actually an organic waste. So in the agricultural industry, um, it only serves to fertilize the maize plant. So once the useful carbs have been harvested, maize tassel is thrown away. And because it's naturally produced, and I'm not modifying it any more than it is already, I just grind it to powder and filter it. And it just happens to work. You just need to optimize your, your conditions, um, which is done. But it's still, as, as of this point, um, we haven't noted any, any disadvantages. That's great to hear and all the best with your research. Thank you so much, Roma. Well, congratulations to your friend's grandparents for 61 years of marriage. Wowzers, congrats. And Ludovic is fully behind the idea of a FameLab band. I think we need to make that happen. Think of all the alumni as well, previous Fame numbers. Okay, plan. Uh, loads of people showing Pinky love in the chat. Gabriella says, Pinky is the queen of water. Uh, Brian is a massive fan of the background and the outfit. Julianne says she is amazing. Uh, hello to British Council Brazil who are watching all of the presentations. Uh, Nath says nice presentation, uh, Pinky. Um, loads of people loving your energy. Yeah, loads of that. Uh, and there's some of this one. Janine says, wow, wow, wow. Uh, such a relevant and necessary talk. Sadly, one more talk to hear. 
but then the audience vote will open. Yes, now our final finalist is Mahmoud Bashir from Egypt. Mahmoud is a medical doctor training to be an oncologist, a cancer doctor at Ain Shams University in Cairo. He is the second of our audience favourites from the semi-finals. And not only does he share a birthday with Gabby, he also shares Gabby's love of Harry Potter and cats. In which case, Akio Mahmoud's talk. Hi everyone. The fight against cancer is challenging, but one of the greatest obstacles is cancer's ability to resist treatment. And to combat this, scientists have developed new techniques and new drugs that target specifically the cancer cells. And yet, the cancer resists. It's frustrating. And resistance happens for a variety of reasons. However, one of the major reasons is actually beyond the cancer. And in order to comprehend, we have to take a step back and take a look at its surroundings. The saying goes, no man is an island. We need our communities with our schools, our policemen, our, our hospitals, and water and, and power supplies. And similarly, no cell is an island. They need their communities called tissues, with blood vessels nourishing them, immune cells protecting them, and even structural proteins holding everything in organized manner. Now, like our communities that need architects that gain the permits needed, interact with the councils and the police, and design everything, our cells need their architects. The fibroblasts. Now, the fibroblasts do a lot, of, a lot of work within our tissue. They promote the formation of new blood vessels to nourish our cells. They produce growth factors to enable the cells to survive. They also work to create structural proteins, keeping everything organized, and even interact with immune, the immune cells whenever needed so that we are safe. Now, interestingly, cancer cells are no different. They need supportive communities to thrive. However, they do not have an architect. So the villains they are, they hijack the cells that we once thought to be bystanders, our own fibroblasts, and they make them do out their evil bidding. They produce excessive structural proteins, making the tissues very stiff, shielding them from the treatment. They produce new blood vessels, giving them nourishment. They inhibit the immune cells so that they cannot be targeted. And all this happens in extremely toxic environments so that the fibroblasts actually behave as if they are in a wound that never heals. This results in two chaotic slums of architecture, in contra contrast to the lovely posh neighborhoods that the fibroblasts are capable of doing. That stiff tissues actually compress the blood vessels, preventing treatment from reaching the cancer. The new blood vessels formed are so immature that they don't even reach the core of the cancer, and so the cells sitting there are immune. And we reach a milestone here, that we know now that we no longer need to just target the cancer cells, but we should also tackle the protective and supportive environment they live in. There are many techniques that are actually proposed on how to do this, but the most applicable and coming soon to the clinic is to block the different activities of the fibroblasts. To do this, we give chemotherapy to attack the cancer, while we use immunotherapy to block those functions, preventing it from forming new blood vessels. However, each cancer manipulates the fibroblasts in a different manner. So we need different combinations fine-tuned to each cancer. And this is where the challenge lies. Now, behind every great structure is a great architect. And with more research in the tumor microenvironment, we'll be able to, we will be able to protect our best and brightest so that they work for us, not against us. Thank you. Well, Mahmoud, thank you very much for your talk. That was a great end for a, a great show today. And my first question, or what my question is about the last thing you were speaking about in your talk, is well, well cancer is not just one disease, but many different diseases, it's, it's uh, many different ways. And what is this uh, immune therapy? How do, they, how do you manage uh, uh, these differences? I would like to hear more about that. Right. So there are a lot of trials ongoing. What we are sure of and we know that every cancer is different. And I'm not just saying that two people with prostate or lung cancer are the same. There are actually intervariations between individuals 
depending on the genetic code. So at the moment, science is moving and, and the medical treatment is moving towards more personalized precision medicine so that we can look into each person's cancer and we can actually do an analysis of it and see where the mutations are. So, for example, if we're going to use immunotherapy that targets the formation of new blood vessels, we actually have to do a test to make sure that this therapy is going to be useful. Now, the tests are ongoing on clinical trials that are done, and this is how they get FDA approved and get into the protocols for treatment. So we know that this specific treatment is effective in that type of cancer if that mutation exists out the, or that subcondition. So it's a lot of if statements, and if they work, we can use that treatment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well done. Okay, I have a question, Mahmoud, and fantastic, and I, I love the outfit, and I love you just stood there and you just bowled, it's, it's, it's great, the charisma was perfect. Um, so everybody uh, is aware of cancer, um, but I'm curious, when you talk to your family, say your mother, your father, your grandparents, or maybe even your little brother or sister, how do you describe your research to them? All right, so my research actually, uh, during my master's degree, I was researching a process known as replication stress. So in order to answer your question, I'm gonna go through the simple terms of how I actually go do this. And what I, what I work is I look during the replication process of the DNA in cancer, if there, are, there is an obstacle or damage to the DNA, this is going to slow down the replication process, which gives us a perfect chance to target the DNA and create more damage so the cell dies. So this is what I was actually researching in how to utilize a weakness within the cancer in order to use it for our own benefit. Thank you, great. Hi Mahmoud, thank you so much um, for your presentation, really fascinating topic. Um, could you tell me a little bit about the time scales? You know, how, how many years in the future do you see these types of treatments being rolled out to patients? Um, definitely. So uh, at the moment when we are speaking of combination treatments to target the micro environment, so at last year actually one of the treatments was approved for a type of cancer called mesothelioma that happens in the pleura or the lining that covers the lung. Uh, there are actually more to come because uh, there are about over 10 different trials ongoing in different phases. So we should be expecting to see results within the next uh, two to maybe four years. And the good thing about most of these trials is that they use combination of existing drugs. So we're not waiting for something novel that hasn't come out yet. There are actually different approaches uh, and new novel drugs that are being suggested, but they are still in the lab phase. But luckily, we are not dependent on them. We are uh, you working with the clinical trials on the, with, on the drugs that are still currently available in the market. Thank you so much. That's very promising to hear. Thank you. Thank you. There's something really poetic, isn't there, about no cell is an island? I really like that. Thanks, Mahmood. OK, let's do a final batch of live comments then. Uh, let's see what we've got. Sun Guy says Mahmood is his favourite oncologist. Uh, everyone says, go Mahmood, you're the best. Um, Fran says everyone is so good. I know, right? What an impossible task for our judges and for you when we get to that bit. Um, Yasmina just says flawless. Gabby says he has the clarity, he has the content, he has the charisma, and he has the cuteness, apparently. Go my mood. Uh, lots of people loving the bow tie, like Carter. Uh, Carter, the dreamer, wants to know if anyone else is going to have a tough time choosing their top three in the audience vote. I would. Wowzers. Uh, Loibov says, my mood, uh, doctors need to be exactly like you, so positive, so full of life, so very relatable, and so trustworthy. Uh, Omar says, it was a truly amazing talk with great scientific content. Cynthia says, congrats to everybody. You are all winners. Uh, and last up, Raneem says, Mahmood is making all of us Egyptians proud. Um, thank you so much, you lot, for all the comments. Really appreciate it. Let's keep them coming. There you go. You have now seen all of our 10 FameLab International finalists perform. And as I've mentioned, the judges' questions and, of course, the presentations were pre-recorded last week. And after they performed, we sent the judges off into their own digital room, virtual champagne in hand, and they fought it out to decide who would be our two runners-up and who would be crowned the FameLab International 2020 champion. Now, they did not tell the finalists 
and they did not tell me. So we will all hear that together very, very soon. However, there's another title up for grabs, and that's the FameLab International 2020 Audience Favourite, and that is out of the hands of our judges and into the hands of you. And the vote for that is now open. The link is in the chat. Have a look in the live chat. The link will be there. We're going to put it on the screen shortly as well. To vote, you need to go to that link. You need to choose your favourite three and then you need to rank them. So just to be super clear, rank your favourite as number one, your second favourite as number two, your third favourite as number three. OK, we're going to give you 10 minutes to do that. I'm going to start the clock. To entertain you in the meantime, I've got a science -y quiz. It's a location geography based science -y quiz. Before that, though, this will help. Here's a quick recap of all the finalists. So who are your top three and who out of those is your top favourite? Uh, what, you've got like eight minutes now? We will tot up the audience vote score after that and uh, I will see if I can talk to them live. Even though we don't know yet who is going to be getting that title. Uh, then our judges will reveal our two FameLab International 2020 runners up. I'm hoping to talk to them as well. Uh, then our judges will announce the FameLab International 2020 champion. And again, I will chat to them if they're on the Zoom call. Uh, while you go vote, here is a quick message from the creators and partners of FameLab, just before we do the quiz, uh, represented by Ali Mall at Cheltenham Festivals and Malcolm Press with the British Council. Cheltenham Festivals created FameLab for two reasons. The first was to connect people with science, enabling us, the general public, to understand the latest research on everything from vaccines to climate change, from renewable energies to new technologies. Secondly, it was to connect scientists with the wider world, giving them a voice outside their place of work. It's through sharing knowledge and learning in this way across continents and industries that FameLab has created a global community of people talking about science and its relevance to our everyday lives. It's through partnership with the British Council that has enabled Cheltenham Festivals to take FameLab international, and we'd like to thank them for working with us to make science a universal language. Hello, my name is Professor Malcolm Press. I'm a trustee of the British Council and a very warm welcome to this year's FameLab International Final. FameLab has been running since 2007 and operates in over 35 countries worldwide. I'm grateful to Cheltenham Festivals as well as to over 200 partners with whom we work. The British Council is the UK's international body for cultural engagement and educational opportunities and this is a great example of the sorts of initiatives that I think we can run. Congratulations to all of you for making it to the final. I wish you every success and I very much look forward to this evening's event. Thank you for listening. Well that's six-ish minutes left uh, so let's have a sciencey quiz. Here's how it's going to work. I'm going to show you some buildings to do with science or research. And what you need to then do is to guess which country that building is in. Bonus points for the city. OK, we're going to start with an easier one. So here it comes. This is part of a building. Think about the shape. 
space. And over 12,500 scientists from over 110 nationalities work here. I reckon you might get this one. If you haven't got it yet, tiny things are smashed together in there. You got it? Okay. Number two, this is a stunning building and the clue here is the water. Number three, these buildings, uh, I should say, are all in countries that our finalists and semi-finalists are representing. Uh, this country is famous for its cherry blossom uh, and if you visit, the local food includes kimchi, soft tofu stew, uh, there's a hangover stew or soup as well. Uh, let's bring up number four. This is a science museum that's made to look like dice. Clues, I guess, are probably in the trees. Look at the trees. Uh, there's a skyscraper in the background. This is in a country that is apparently the world's number one orchid exporter, which may not help unless you're big into botany. Uh, all right, number five, here it is, number five. Uh, trees may be less of a clue here as well, but you can see more of the city. Um, this is where one of our semi-finalists is currently researching. It's in one of Europe's oldest countries, oldest capitals, in fact. Uh, looks like there are some mountains nearby, maybe a good place for skiing in the winter. Two left, number six. Uh, this one, hmm, a national science centre, but where? This country is the third largest natural rubber producer in the world, the world's largest supplier of rubber gloves. Looks like that car is on the left-hand side of the road. Getting trickier. Okay, last one. Uh, last but by no means least, it's a futuristic swimming pool. No, it's not. Um, what is it? It's something really worth visiting. It's an amazing architecture from the country that surprisingly introduced chocolate in Europe. Okay, cool, I'll take that one off. Those are your seven pictures. Results coming up very soon. I think we've got time for a quick bonus round. All right, quick bonus round coming up. Who tweeted that? I'm gonna show you some tweets by some of this year's FameLab judges. You need to guess which one of them tweeted it. Uh, there is one tweet which isn't by one of our judges but by another famous scientist and science communicator. So see if you can spot that one. Okay, let's have a look at the first one. Oh my word, Nigella Lawson, your double buttered toast. Hashtag eat, cook, repeat. Uh, who is that then? Is it Giles Yeo? Is it Susie Gage? Or is it Martin Coth? What do you reckon? Second one. So I went to the zoo and I took three pictures. Apparently the penguins didn't like this, but it's now a grade one listed structure. Uh, here is the structure. I've seen this actually. Yeah, they can't change it. Penguins don't like it, but they can't change that because it's, uh, it's listed. Was that John Chase? Was that Sheena Cruikshank? Or was that Roma Agrawal? Here's the next one. Uh, here's the next one. This is how I see myself when I'm doing astronomy. Is that Christina Melodou? Susie Gage or Martin Coth. All right, number four. Number four, oh, I just have to do another Iron Man. Um, and that looks absolutely delicious, whatever that is. Right, so was that Sheena Cruikshank? Was it John Chase or was it Nadia Adewale? What do you reckon? Last up then, uh, this, is, this is the Google Translate of this tweet. Um, and I think the hashtag is World Toilet Day, I think. Um, uh, World Toilet Day, I find it wonderful. The one with mathematical ideas has occurred to me there, a day to celebrate together with your loved ones. Um, be careful with what you throw that ends up in the sea. Yeah, so who was this one? I mean, we should get this one, right? Was it Eduardo's Science de Cabathon? Was it Christina Melodou or Giles Yeo? What do you reckon? Okay. It's almost time. I hope you're getting those votes in. I hope you're getting those votes in. It's almost time to wrap the votes up. So let's quickly do the answers. It's a bit of fun, isn't it? So here are the science building answers. The first one is, hopefully you got that, is the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN on the border of France and Switzerland. Uh, number two is, when we take off the blurring, it's the Natural History Museum in Venice in Italy. You get a point, I mean, it's not a competition really, but I'm going to give you a point for the country. I'm going to give you two points if you manage to say the right city. Uh, and I'll give you three points if you say the building. All right, cool. Um, number three, this is Pohang University of Science and Technology in Pohang, Korea. This is where Ga Yun is researching. So, number four, this is the National Science Museum in Thailand. 
number five. Where was this? This is Sofia University in Bulgaria, where Evo, the Bulgarian national champion, is based. Looks beautiful. Uh, this one, number six, is the Science Centre in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And the last one, this one is the Science Museum in Valencia, in Spain. Okay, bonus round then of who tweeted that. Here are the answers. Here's the first one. Uh, oh my word, Nigella Lawson, your double buttered toast. This was tweeted by Giles Yo. Uh, okay, let's have a look at the next one. Uh, there was a clue in this one, if you remember what this person uh, is an expert in. Went to the zoo, took this picture, penguins don't like it, but you've got to keep it up, was Roma Aguam, right? Involved in building the shard. Um, this, this is how I see myself when I'm doing astronomy. This was the clip, this was the, uh, the cheeky one, right? This is the bonus one. It's not actually any of those three. It was actually Brian Cox. So uh, this, is, this is Brian saying, this is what he thinks he looks like when he's doing astronomy. Um, we've got two more, just have to do another Iron Man with that picture. Who was it? It was Nadia Alawadi. Um, that looks delish. Right, and last one, I mean, come on. This one you should have got uh, about World Toilet Day. Obviously it's not, it's written in Spanish. And yes, it was Eduardo. So this was uh, Eduardo, one of our judges. Okay, brill. Now, how are we doing, you lot? Have we closed? Are we good? Okay, fantastic. Now, before I reveal who got the most of your votes and will become the FameLab International 2020 audience favorite, let's hear from our judges about what they particularly enjoyed and what impressed them. It has been such an incredible pleasure being a judge on FameLab this year. I've been so impressed that this is the first time I've ever judged and it's just been incredible to see all of these scientists and engineers, mathematicians from all around the world coming together. And I, I feel like I feel really uplifted in what's been a really difficult and negative year. I feel so happy and inspired, um, firstly to bring all these people from all over the world together in this virtual format, but also because the research and the science that they're all doing is absolutely incredible and every single one of them is going to have such a big impact on our world. So it, yeah, it's just been completely um, emotional, mind-blowing experience for me. So all I can say is, wow. Um, I, I do this as a job, you know, this is, this is my full-time thing, this is my occupation. And you guys are jumping into it from different occupations where your research is related and then you're trying to communicate it. And I'm absolutely gobsmacked, um, astounded, by you guys' ability to not only take a topic and find a way to get it across, but also do it in such a quick turnover time, because I understand you've done different, slightly different topics and approaches before, and you've all managed to sit back down and produce another communication and deliver it so absolutely well. Um, some great ideas there, some things that has left my mind swimming, um, some great approaches as well. Um, use, use of technology and props has been absolutely fantastic and some of you are just such engaging speakers that quite frankly i'm a bit jealous so well done to all of you it's absolutely phenomenal so for me this was a great great experience and not only because what john just said that the, the uh, all the participants are great performers and they really really did a great job i wish i had you in spain all of you uh, but there's also some other things. One is how well you adapted to the digital version of, of the FameLab uh, competition. Uh, that was great. Uh, I'm feeling very jealous. That would be very hard to me. We all have been adapting uh, in the last times to do an online version of our talks and etc. cetera. And, and you did it very well. And I got some ideas from that. And the other thing I... I knew it was there, but I hadn't really noticed before, is that the science that is spoken about in FameLab is different as science evolves. So it's very uh, up to date. And that was, very, that was great. And I so said, I learned a lot, not only about communicating, but also about science, the, the science that is actually going on. And that's great.
Oh, it's all getting very exciting here, I tell you, behind the scenes. So, we have the name of the audience favourite, okay? I'm not going to tell you that just yet, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the runners-up first. Now, these are equal runners-up, okay? Um, first of all, we're going to go and... Uh, actually, can we just go up a bit? I just want to check on this one. Yeah, okay. So, first... We're going to go to, uh, to Roma, who's going to tell us who the first equal runner-up is. This particular contestant, we were incredibly impressed at the props that they used. It was a very slick show of props coming in and out of the screen. Um, we really loved that. They talked about historical things, they explained some complex science and computational theory um, and it was so engaging. I just really, really enjoyed this presentation. So it's my pleasure to announce that the runner-up is Ahmed. Yes! Ahmed, you are the first of our joint runner-up. Now, the reason this is all so bonkers is because we've got our finalists on a Zoom call. You might have seen us setting that up just before. And here he is. Here's Ahmed. Hello. One second, he says. Oh, hello. That was some feedback. Is this the person that's sometimes underneath? Oh, look, put in the background in. Hi, Ahmed. Hello. I can hear you. Nice one, buddy. First of all, great choice of outfit. Hello. Hiya. <laughs> okay. This always uh, happens. Oh. Okay, I've got thumbs up from some of the other finalists, but it sounds like there's a little bit of a problem going on um, there. So hopefully everyone else can mute themselves, and we can try again. Hello, Ahmed, can you hear me? Hello. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> Is that Hi. not... Hello, mate. Hello, mate. Are you there? Oh, I, okay. Greg is Greg muted. Is all right, there's all sorts of feedback. You know what? You know what I was saying about technology? It's worked so well so far, but it always happens in a Zoom call. You at least have to have 30 seconds of someone saying, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Is the camera on? Is the camera on? Ahmed, let's try again. So, uh, ah, they can't hear me, apparently, which means that a few people are frantically plugging in some cables behind the scenes to see if we can get my sound to Ahmed. Uh, hello. 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 How's that? Finally, OK. I can hear you. How are you doing? Um, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. That was uh, good news for me. Thanks a lot. Cool. Well, congratulations. Um, first things first. Thank you. Thank you for everybody. There's, there's no way, no chance I could have done this without my, my, my friends and my family. This is a team effort. And I wish I had a list to thank everybody who, who have contributed to this work. Oh, 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 wait, wait. Oh, my God. I have a list. But I, I, I just want, want to thank my friends and my family and British Council here in Qatar and the QNRF. They always support education and uh, learning opportunities. Thank you, everybody. Can I just ask you a question? You're, 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 you're the you're king, king of props, of props. right? You're the absolute king of props. Well, you can say so. Yeah. <laughs> So how on earth do you manage to deal with all those props? We saw someone else creep into the shop. Are they, were they helping? How do you do it? Well, it's just a gift, you know? I, I like to, to, to simplify science. I like to, to people to, to digest science, to like science. And visual effects always is, is, a, is an attractive for, for, for people who like to, to find the first step to get into science before we go deep into the, you know, the hard work. And um, fantastic and interesting topic, crypto analysis. Um, what do you think is next? You kind of touched on it in the, in the judges, uh, judges' questions, but what excites you about kind of what's next in that area? Oh, apparently I'm, I'm muted again. Well, maybe, maybe, oh. maybe I, I missed the last part. But That's all right. I was saying, what excites you? Thank you very much. All right. Well, 
It's lovely to chat to you, it really is. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> See ya. All right, I think we need to plug in a few more cables and trouble the shoot this one. But of course, what we need to do now is announce an hour's 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 announce and I especially liked uh, the use of intonation um, and, and almost an awareness of the people that are watching from this side. Um, They're very personable, um, almost brought us into their world and gave us an insight into what they do and the problems they face on a daily basis and, and in this day and age now as well. Um, and particularly as well, in the answers afterwards, there was, there was a consistency between how they delivered uh, in their actual three minutes and how they answered the questions afterwards. So I was very impressed by that um, and it was very eloquently put. Uh, so, this runner up was... Rebecca! Rebecca! Hello, you. you, 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 you. All right, Greg? How are you feeling right now? You know, for a science communication competition, I wish I could communicate what I'm feeling. But all the words have gone straight out of my head. I'm just, um, I'm so happy. This is, yeah, this has been absolutely amazing. Um, you've been doing something quite different. You've been uh, doing spoken word poetry about your research into autism. Um, how difficult is it to take your science and then write spoken word poetry about it? I think it's rather difficult. I think if you sit down and actually tried it, you would maybe struggle and find it difficult, but I think mostly you'd find it really fun and creative. It's much better to put your creativity in something that you make, because then there's a part of yourself in your work. And I hope that people have seen that and can recognize that it's not just a scientist of their own research, or it's a person trying to get what they're doing out there and showing how important it is and oh my goodness my hands are shaking um what i also loved um was you talking about putting the creative in science so i just want to applaud you kind of personally for that i thought that was really important um what's next for you in your in your science communication journey do you think oh greg i knew you'd ask us something like that <laughs> hoping to publish a short animation alongside my poem but for now I'm just thinking about getting some dinner yeah me too <laughs> me too also quick question you were clever at changing your mugs each que each uh, each judge question how many mugs do you have I don't quite know what you're <laughs> Oh, someone's being very, very clever. Um, Rebecca, congratulations. Absolutely brilliant. Um, lovely to speak to you and congratulations again. Well done. Lovely, thank you very much. Right. It's gonna go, we're gonna go for the audience vote winner now. So we're gonna find out your FameLab International audience vote winner. Um, and for that, I'm just gonna give you the person's name and we are gonna cut to the person on the screen, okay? So I can reveal that the winner of the audience vote is Gabby. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, you. You are the audience favorite. How do you feel? I can't, my, brand, my brand is not working in English right now. I'm so sorry for that. I, oh my God, I'm just grateful for all of this. And 
this is a science a science communication competition and and i i just want to say that the audience votes is the best answer i could have so it's just that i'm feeling happy and emotional right now and i'm sorry because i'm almost crying but thank you that's fine we're, we're cool with that we're cool with that so here's my question um science communication you know, in different countries is kind of seen in different ways. I know that, uh, I know that it's, it's kind of, in your country, it's kind of really applauded, really celebrated. I believe this is even a TV show, right? What do you think that means for science? Uh, we have lots of great scientists in Brazil, and I believe we can have more, you know, communicators in science in Brazil, but we have, we really have a big audience, and I like to spend life so much because people were really engaging in, in, in watch everybody's talk and, you know, and cheer, and this, this was amazing. I think that's now more than ever because we're living this moment with pandemic, you know, communicate science is so, so important. And I just want to thank you because, you know, Brazil is a very large country. I want to thank you all the Brazilians, but I know that uh, we all ha had votes from other places too. And I want to thank uh, everybody that voted for me, everybody that still, you know, connected with the talk because this was the end, you know, make a connection so people who understand how science can impact their life and act with the results. I want to just also thank my fellow family members from Brazil because I'm not just me right now, I'm us and they were with me throughout the process. So thank you very much guys. Thank you everybody. <laughs> Gabby, um, great to speak to you and thank you, you know, you do incredible research as we heard as well. So uh, good luck with all your science communication, good luck more with the research and uh, congratulations for being the audience favourite. <laughs> awesome. Oh, here we go then. It's time to find out who the judges have international champion and I'm going to turn to our final judge who's going to announce it. Eduardo, over to you. So, this was one of the hardest times in my life, <laughs> in our lives, I would say. I, I, I think I won't do this again, <laughs> because it's not just that you have to choose uh, among different levels of performance. It's just like choosing among different versions of perfection. So, please don't do this again to us. <laughs> um, but we have a winner. We have a winner, and um, well, honestly, any, anyone could have been the winner. So, but we have one. We got one winner. Did I say that we have a winner? We do have a winner, and this winner made this, these three C's. You see, this talk gave us content. Yes, this this talk had great science, beautiful science, useful science. Had it clarity? Oh yes, it was very clear. It was everyone was uh, engaged. What was this talk uh, with? What this talk was saying, and we learned a lot. We really learned a lot about this science and charisma. Well, you will appreciate once you once you know who the winner is. Yes, it was fantastic to hear this person speaking. Not only in, during the talk, but also during the answer to the, to the questions. So, you gave us science, you gave us fun, you gave us hope. You are the winner, Shora Deep from Switzerland. Congratulations and thank you very much for that beautiful, beautiful talk. Congratulations. Shora Deep, huge congratulations. I was watching you watch that and your reaction was just like, <gasps> how are you feeling right now? Numb, to be just very short. I'm really, uh, wow, I'm, I, 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 I just can't put everything together. I mean, I, I probably need a second or two to just put my thoughts together. I mean, um, thank you, thank you so much so much, you know, the judges and every one of you watching here right now, I mean, I, I, I just feel so grateful over here to, well, 
you did an amazing presentation. Um, you had charisma, you had so much content, you had clarity, and your content was about something really important. Yeah, as, as were lots of our finalists, it was about, yeah, I think you put it that we need to capture carbon before carbon captures us. So clearly really important. What do you think next in that world? Like what, what can we be, you know, you work on these materials, right? This is your day job. and the importance of carbon capture as a promising technology to combat it. We see now more awareness about it, we see more um, um, uh, initiatives and acceptances by different industries from around the world, people around the world, the governments around the world, people all coming in and investing and uh, like promoting and trying to make more out of this time. So in the future, yes, definitely in the next five years, I and mean, uh, like we are all looking forward to see more of uh, this science being used in the real industry, you know, like yeah. when, when we actually see that, okay, it's like, like I remember the time that, that when I first moved on to this field, it was during my master's in India, it was like, I was always fascinated by seeing these molecules and computers, but seeing them in a real life, you know, um, when, when you have an experimental teams and they come up with these images or the 3D, 3D image which I came out with, seeing these in real life and that gives you a joy that, that this is our baby which we have been working for and now this is like a new product in the world. And I, having seeing it in the real world, actually getting those CO2 molecules inside and I can, this is an ambition which every one of us had. I'm sure my, my, my supervisor, my lab mates, my, all the other people involved in this field from different parts of the world, they had all ambition this thing and this is, yeah, I mean, I, I can just say that, yeah, in, in the coming years we are seeing these things happening in real. I love, I love how excited you are about your research. I, I just, your passion uh, just, just jumps through the screen. And I want to know what's it been like being part of FameLab International 2020? I mean, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of adjectives to uh, describe it, but indeed, I mean, uh, as some of the participants and, and as you all mentioned, I mean, the biggest prize for us is definitely being a part of this family and all, being a part of this family, family, getting to know each other, you know, like even though we couldn't this year, even though we couldn't meet each other in person, in physically, but the way we were connected, you know, like we were sharing, the, we were cheering for each other during our talks, we were having this nervous period, you know, patting for each other, supporting each other and sharing our science and research and just getting, know, getting to know about all these different forms of sharing science. And this is something which, uh, I mean, is, was like a magical um, uh, feeling. I mean, and especially, I mean, I mean, yes, the downside was we couldn't be there in person in Cheltenham. But on the upside, if I see the upside, the fact that it is being now streamed live and people from all across the world are seeing and from the Swiss National Finals, you know, like my friends and family in India, my professors here, my lab mates, all the other friends and everyone, people from all of, across the world. And I really take this opportunity to thank you, thank every one of you. I mean, uh, I mean the support and encouragement has been really, really special. And yeah, I mean, that's it. I mean, it, that, that's how it sums up everyone. It, it sums up this entire thing. It's really special. I'm really, I feel, I really feel grateful that I got this opportunity uh, of being here in this platform. In a way, yeah, that we are like representing uh, people and everything. But I don't know. Again, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what to say. It's just. I think you've mind. I think you've said it all, uh, and and your words are moving, and it's just welcome to the family, <laughs> the FameLab family. Um, huge, huge congratulations. Um, well done, Sorodi. Congratulations, and yeah, once again, congratulations to all the participants and all the people over here, man. Oh, you've got a, you've got an amazing uh, trophy coming your way. All right, see you, Sorodi. Congratulations. Oh wow. Um, Thank you. Can I just say a huge thank you, really echo that, to all the finalists tonight. 
Um, and that pretty much wraps up the FameLab International 2020 final. I will do a final batch of live comments in a second. Uh, before that, though, some quick thank yous to our judges. John Chase, Roma Agrawal, uh, Eduardo, uh, Science de Cavathon, hope I said that okay, uh, to the FameLab team at Cheltenham Festivals and the British Council, to Malcolm Love, uh, to Kareem, Anastasia Lewis and Vanessa for the masterclasses, to the production team at Still Moving Media for all the edits and the live stream today. Um, let me just grab the iPad. Last few comments from you lot. Um, celebrating it. Simone says, well done. Tara says, uh, Sora Deep's passion and energy was wonderful to see. Uh, Ronaldo says, congrats to all 10, uh, all the fame labbers all over the world. Dimitri says, really proud of you. Um, everyone says, what a reaction. You can tell how overwhelmed Sora Deep was with happiness. Um, and Simone, let's end with you. You say, you are all winners. Thank you so, so much for joining it. That is it. My name is Greg Foote. Thank you for joining me tonight. We'll see you again soon. Let's have a watch back of all our 20 finalists. Here we go. Bye. <laughs>